And so it, it's uh, out of the a book of Matthew, and I'm not going to reread it. It's already been read uh, for your hearing. Uh, but there, there is this this idea that that is in Matthew, and we'll get to it uh, shortly. We'll get to it shortly. There's this idea in Matthew that that is is a good one, and uh, one of the things that that I, I look at is is who's talking, who's doing the talking, and and since Jesus is talking, I be a good person to listen to and uh, and and so I, I thought I, I thought I'd do that but there there is this illustration I, I want to give to us who are uh, in the body and as well as those who may be considering uh, making a choice a decision to be part of the body when I may have told this story some time ago and it was at a night service and so if I did tell it at night very few people heard it so I can tell it <laughs> tell it again <coughs> and, <laughs> and and tell it again it'll be like new <coughs> when I was a little when I was a little guy I, I must have been uh, four or five maybe three or four maybe and uh, I grew up in Idaho Falls and a lot of Idaho Falls Idaho a lot of you know that and uh, when I was coming up uh, they, we didn't have an inside uh, bathroom facility yeah, a little old wood house uh, that that we went to, and uh, they call them outdoor toilets now, not outhouses. But we had one of those little things. And periodically, for whatever reason, they want to move uh, the thing and kind of clean it up and let things decompose. We weren't expecting this, were you? But I need you to paint. I need to give this picture to you. <clears throat> and and so. And so for whatever reason, my brother and his friend, Dwayne, uh, they were up on top. They were moving the outhouse and they had a mound, dug it out. It's, it's, a, it's called a banjo ditch, B-E-N-J-O, banjo ditch. <clears throat> and, and all this waste is in there. So they're up on top and they're throwing dirt clods. Anybody know what a dirt clod is? Yeah, dirt clod into the, the ditch there. And so they're throwing and so I get up there with my new cowboy boots and my cowboy outfit, and I start throwing dirt clods into the the ditch with them. Well, uh, I'm throwing, <clears throat> and as I'm throwing, I slip, poof, and I go into the banjo ditch. And there I am, face up, and I see two little faces disappear over the mounds. They, ran, my brother and his friend, ran off. And then there was a face that appeared over the top and I'm looking up and it was my sister <clears throat> and she was looking down at me she had to be about five I guess and she's looking down at me and she's saying give me your hand give me your hand and so I reach up and I give my hand to her and she pulls me out of all of this stuff I don't know how she did it I still don't know how she did it. but she gets me out of all of that goop and and uh, I tell you quite frankly I don't remember the rest of what happened <clears throat> Uh, uh, but I was out of it. She pulled me out of it. But that's what God did for us. Mm -hmm. We were in the banjo ditch of sin. And God sent Jesus on a rescue mission to pull us out of it. And it, it doesn't matter uh, what, what shape you thought you were in. What, how, how well you think you're dressed and how you look and... And maybe your banjo ditch isn't addiction or stealing or something really, really bad. In fact, you may have lived an exemplary life. But I'm telling you, you were still in that banjo ditch. And the strange thing about it is Diablos got you fooled into thinking that you're not in the banjo ditch. And, and, but nevertheless, your sin still is offensive to the nostrils of God. And, and so what I'm here to do is share with you what God through Jesus has done for his people. He has sent a redeemer, a rescue uh, for us out of that situation we were in. And some people are quite content to be in all of that mess because Diablos has given them some bling. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I call it, you know, do they still use bling? Am I out of fashion? Okay. Diablos bling. You, you know, they say Satan can masquerade as an angel of light. And so he has some people fooled into thinking that his bling is the real thing. Yeah, that that they, they somehow confuse it. And so they're thinking that they're all right. But it's just the bling of Satan got them all fooled. And, and so what people then do is they pursue a number of things. They, we pursue a number of things. I, I want to stop saying you because I'm in this thing with you all. We, we continue to pursue a number of things that, that may not be what God wants us pursuing. And so when you think about what Jesus is saying in Matthew 6, you've got to put it in a context. And sometimes you've got to go way back to the Old Testament to get a context uh, for it. And then Amos 4, or Hosea 4, as Hosea 4, I'm getting ahead of myself, Hosea 4, uh, I know quick-fingered Owen Kraft is there. He has this scripture in the Old Testament, probably page 1492. What, what page is it in your Bible? Uh, 956. Oh, 956. <laughs> page 956. Owen, would you read what Hosea says there. Verse number one. Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of so Israel. here's Hosea prophesying to Israel. And Hosea is prophesying just before Israel is going to go in captivity with Syria. And Hosea says, Hear, O Israel. He says it in that kind of voice, I would imagine. He's a prophet of God. What does he say? For the Lord hath a controversy. He says, the Lord has, I like the version that says, has a case. But that's King James, is it? Yes, sir. He says, has a controversy. With the inhabitants of the Wait. land. Because there Here is. Here Hosea says, the Lord has a case. He has a controversy. He has something that is legitimately, he has a concern about. He's bringing a charge against you, Israel. What's the charge? Because there is no truth. He says, because there is no truth. Now, this is Hosea, the prophet of God, saying, the Lord is speaking to me, and he has a charge, he has a case, he has a controversy with you, and he says, there is no truth. What else? Read. Nor mercy. Nor mercy. Nor knowledge nor of God knowledge in the land. In the land, knowledge. There's a, a favorite passage. It says, for lack of knowledge, my people are destroyed. It'll come later in the same uh, uh, chapter. For lack of knowledge, my people uh, are destroyed. And, and God is saying, you know what? There's no knowledge in the land. Not that you haven't got a PhD or a master's or a bachelor's or that you just regular old smart. What knowledge is God talking about? There's no knowledge of me. God's charge against the people of Israel is that they are his people and they don't know him. They don't know what he requires. And he's saying, I have a case against you. And, and later on in that, you've got to read this. It's, it's good reading. Hosea chapter 4. And then the, put it in its context. They're going into, the, God has made up his mind. Israel is not going to be a nation anymore. That's the controversy he has. He says, I'm uprooting you. Israel will never be a nation again. When he says again, that's exactly what it meant no matter what happened in 1947. Israel will never be a nation. That's what he says. And so the controversy is, my people don't know me. Well, what is there to know? What, what does he want them to know? He wants people to have an attitude that reflects who he is. We have to have an attitude that reflects who we are. If we are God's people, there is an attitude that God's people have. There is a way that God's people think. And I still hold to the belief that as you think, that's what you will do. Your thinking or your behavior follows your thinking. You think it long enough, you will do it. 
And sometimes we think so fast we can't catch up with what, our, what we've just done. And we say, how did I do that? Well, you thought about it and you did it. You know, that's, that's what happens. And, and so what, what God is saying, you are not aware of who I am. You don't have any mercy. The truth of God's word is not in you. That's what he's saying to the people of Israel. He says, that's my case against you. And because of that, know where it starts? He says, it starts with the priests. Well, who are the priests of Israel? The ones responsible for guiding the people into the knowledge of who God is. And he says, I'm not going to bring a charge against them either. I'm not going to bring a charge against the people. All of you are responsible. Guess what? There ain't nobody you can point to as, as, as people of God and say, well, the priests are responsible for what my thinking was and how I got off track. It, it's what they told me. That's how I got off track. Who's responsible for your thinking? Who's responsible for your action? Who's responsible for what you do? Yeah, you, 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 and you, and me. I, I can't go looking at Maxwell. Maxwell made me do it. Well, Maxwell said I can't do that. Uh, I can't go looking anywhere else. And so that's what God is saying. I have a controversy against the people. And so here, I'm putting this all in a context, in an Old Testament context, because that's where these scriptures come from in the New Testament. Here in Matthew, it's in an Old Testament context. And Jesus is just helping his disciples see what they ought to be thinking, how they ought to be thinking. And so he's framing this in a, in a context that we need to understand as well, because it's going to help us. And so here it is. Uh, uh, Jesus says uh, to the people, beginning in Matthew chapter 5, you know the Beatitudes. I'm going to need some help, Aaron, because I know you went to Sunday school. And one of the things they, they taught you in Sunday school is the Beatitudes. If I look at the young kids now and say, do you know what the Beatitudes are? I'm picking on some kids. They'll say, I don't know the Beatitudes. Well, who's responsible for teaching the kids the Beatitudes? Okay, so if they don't know the Beatitudes, how can, uh, if, if they don't so know the Beatitudes, how are the children going to know the Beatitudes? And so, why is it important to know what Jesus has prescribed for his people? Why is it important? Because these words are ways of saying who we are. These are attitudes. And so he says in chapter 5, verse number 1, and this is NIV. Who has the NIV? I want you to help me out. He says, now seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down. And it says his disciples came to him and he began teaching them. He said, what did he say? He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who don't know they need help. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And then he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Then what does he say? Blessed are the merciful. What? The merciful. Then he says, blessed are the merciful. What's the case that God has against the people of Israel? They're lacking mercy. And so Jesus comes around and says to the disciples in here in chapter five, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And he said, blessed are you, talking to his disciples. Blessed are you when you are insulted, persecuted. And they speak all kinds of evil against you for my name's sake or because of me. He says, rejoice and be glad for great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Wait a minute. He's talking to his disciples. So it tells me in these few verses that his disciples are going to be persecuted. People are going to say some unkind things about his disciples. They're going to be insulted. It, it tells me that. And then he says something interesting to his disciples in this mountain discourse, this mountain sermon. He says 
that you are the salt of the earth. And, and then he says something interesting. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? He said it's not good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. He's giving us a clue to how we ought to be behaving. What salt does, what salt is used for. We have to act like we have a purpose that is God-given purpose with God's vision. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> uh, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of people acting like they don't have a purpose. Christians acting like they don't have a purpose. Followers of God acting like they don't have a purpose. You may not want to do God's purpose, and sometimes that's just what we need to say. I don't want to do what God is proposing. I mean, if we're just going to walk down honesty road, we may as well just say, I don't want to do what God is proposing. That I don't want to do that. I'd rather do this. God, doesn't this sound like a better idea to you? And if we don't get an answer from God, we like to say, well, he just uh, is telling me to wait. <laughs> telling me to wait while I figure out what I'm going to do in lieu of what he wants done. And he's just telling me to wait on my blessing. He's telling me to wait until I find my purpose. <laughs> I'm of the suspicion that he's just giving you a delusion. <laughs> And said, go on, do what you want to do, but I got something waiting for you in the end, since you want to go your way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of people thinking, yeah, he's just, I'm waiting on my blessing. <laughs> Delusional. God's purpose is what you need to be, what we need to be doing. His purpose. It's interesting. It says, for lack of vision, uh, Proverbs 29, for lack of vision, my people perish. Well, whose vision? Hmm. And those who obey the law are blessed. We need to follow God's vision. And, and that's a bigger vision than our vision. And so when people say, without vision, people perish, whose vision? Yours that you came up with on your bed at night? Your dream of what you wanted to have done? Your dream of how you see things? Or are you following what God wants you to do? We got the whole idea of what kind of knowledge, whose knowledge. The knowledge is about God. How much do you really know about God? That's what Jesus is teaching here. He's at the, the name of this title of this lesson is uh, the bare essentials. More than enough. Jesus is just outlining the, outlining the bare essentials for the disciples of his. And it has to do with your thinking. You look at the Beatitudes, they seem as if they're just isolated things. I used to be a child and I'd read the Bible and I'd come to the Beatitudes and I'd look and say, well, I don't want to be poor in spirit. I don't want to be poor in anything. So I don't want that Beatitude. Oh, there's a Beatitude. Uh, the merciful. Yeah, I want to be shown some mercy. I'll be merciful. So I would pick and choose which beatitude I want to be. Here's the problem with that. The beatitudes is a reflection of everything and thought and purpose that the disciple has. Guess what? If you are filled with the Holy Spirit, which fruit don't you want to have? Well. <laughs> yeah. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. I don't want the goodness part because people ain't good to me. Mercy, and I don't want that either. Gentleness and self-control. I don't want any of those self-control things. But I'm filled with the Spirit, so I'm picking and choosing which fruit the, uh, the, fruit is, uh, the Spirit is going to produce. The Beatitudes are who we are as Christians. It should be reflective in everything that we do and say and how we behave to one another and everybody else. Everybody get that? And so here we are trying to pick and choose what vision, what purpose God has for us and how we're going to behave as children of God. Who decides, who gets to choose how we're supposed to behave? 
the Lord does. Since you are, since we are his disciples, who gets to tell me what to do? Who gets to teach me how I should behave? The teacher does. And so here he is, Jesus is teaching his uh, disciples the type of attitude, how they ought to behave. And then here again, after salt, he says, you are the light of the world. A town set on a hill cannot be hid. And he says, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. How should we behave then as disciples? We ought to be light illuminating a darkened world. But the opposite is true a lot of times. We have the light and we put it under a bowl for fear that we might be found out. For fear that it will conflict with the popular uh, sayings of contemporary society. Well, guess what Jesus is doing? He's saying to the same people in contemporary society of that time, here's how disciples behave. You don't think the people that Jesus is talking to had some of the same issues that we do? That's why I have begun to love the Bible more and more and appreciate God more and more. Every generation struggles with the same sin problem, just dressed up differently. Is there struggles with people coveting? Is there struggles with people stealing, lying, cheating, adultery, fornication? And the list goes on with the evil things that we can do. You think that's new to the world or did it just come about in the 21st century? <laughs> that, that Jesus is talking culturally. Oh gosh. Jesus is talking from a cultural standpoint. And so what he's saying really doesn't apply to us today because it's putting it in a cultural context. <laughs> and, and so we can just ignore some of the things that he says here because you have to understand um, that, that Jesus is really illuminating and sharing with his disciples back then. And what he says really doesn't matter to, you, to us today. And, and, and so forth, and as far as Paul is concerned, the way he says and puts things, really we can ignore that too. Uh, because really he is talking about a generation and uh, that's more of his contemporary style. And on and on and on it goes to we are confused. But the one thing that Jesus says in whatever cultural context you want to put it in is, my sheep hear my voice. But that's not really Jesus talking after all, or lettering isn't in red, so we really don't have to pay attention to that. The lettering isn't in red, we don't have to pay attention to that. And so here's, here's, and so here's what I want you to know, is everything we know about Jesus, how do we know it? Well, yeah, we know it because the apostles wrote it. And so that's how we know who Jesus was and what we ought to be doing. And so when we talk about eliminating or structuring and getting rid of what one apostle said, what are we doing? We're uh, uh, eviscerating the word of God. Where did it come from? The apostles. Who taught the apostles? Jesus did. And he said, you will teach everybody else and you're going to have a comforter who's going to remind you of everything you need to know. And if, you, if they hear you, they hear me and the one who sent me. So when you read and hear from the apostles, you're hearing from God. <laughs> Do not be persuaded by the argument of postmodern society. I subscribe to the fact there's always been a postmodern society. <laughs> People say, what are you talking about, Jeremiah? <sighs> I'm talking about... There's always been a contemporary society. Mm -hmm. And there's always been an, a society after, and there's always one before. And the one that came after, I call it postmodern. <laughs> 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 Here, here's what we need to know. 
is that Jesus is helping his uh, uh, disciples see some very important attitudes that we have to have as well. And, and so it takes us back then. He's uh, outlining the, the attitudes in Matthew 5, brings us to Matthew 6, and says, here's some attitudes that are going to affect your behavior eternally. Matthew 6, 25 is where it brings us to. He says, I know that you are concerned with lots of different things. He knows that about the disciples. Were disciples concerned uh, about uh, a place to live, clothes to put on their back, what they were going to eat? Do, did they have those kind of worries and concerns that we have? They must have because Jesus is addressing them. He says, take note, don't be worried. Don't, don't dwell on excessively about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, and what you're going to wear. Don't, don't do that. But instead, do what? Take it to God, your heavenly Father. <sighs> you know, the hardest thing uh, for, 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 for me is this whole idea of if, if you don't worry about uh, what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear uh -huh. and what you're going to drink, uh -huh. uh, how do you live? <laughs> I mean, don't you have to eat something? You can't go out naked. Uh, and so, it's talking about don't worry about it, don't think about it, don't ex be overly excessive about thinking about it. <clears throat> well, how, 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 how do you get what you need if you don't put some thought into it? You got to think about how to get a job. That that's where I I go with it. Uh, and when you get the job, how are you going to spend that money? <laughs> uh, because if uh, if I know correctly, uh, our government does pretty much what we do, and we do pretty much what our government does. We spend, and we spend. Did I just say government? Is this a, one of those political sermons? <laughs> I'm making a point that we tend to go into debt and we tend to go into debt unnecessarily it is what 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 uh, and so if I'm overly concerned about what I'm going to eat what I'm going to wear what I'm going to drink what am I focused on if I'm not focused on God and if I'm focused on what I'm going to eat what I'm going to drink what I'm going to wear and I'm that's my, what drives my thought where are my God thoughts there are things that can really drive us to the point where we, we think we're thinking about God. And what we're really thinking about God is, how do you get me out of this? <laughs> and so we think about what I'm going to eat, what we're going to wear, what we're going to drink. Why is Jesus saying this to his disciples back then? Because they were worried about the same things that we worry about. But if you're focused on that, when does God get your thinking time? And what you think about ultimately is what you begin to work on. Oh. What you think about is what you ultimately begin working on. The purpose of God for the new, for the new Christian Start to say new age Christian. I was in Sedona uh, last uh, a couple of Sundays ago. There's a new age movement, and I'll talk about that later on. But for the Christian, what's God's purpose for us? To glorify Him, to seek and save the lost, to teach, to love one another deeply. That's His purpose for us. But if we're thinking and worried about clothing, food, and drink, how are we focused on what it is God wants? And I submit to you that you can't focus on two things at one time. One will get more of your attention than the other. And I believe that Jesus is right. You cannot serve both God and money. You can't. Your focus becomes divided. It's divided. So we need to focus on, we need to make a, our decision on who we're going to follow. What's your purpose? What's your pursuit? What is it you're running after? Are you pursuing 
God with a purpose? Or are you pursuing your purpose for your pursuit's sake to get the money that you need? Who's defining your purpose? If you're thinking about just the transitory things in life, that has your thinking. Everybody following me? And how is it then that you can share the gospel of Jesus Christ if you're concerned about money? Because now it's not Jesus is providing for me. It's the money. I've become self-sufficient. Lord, and we extend our palms up and out and say, give me, give me, give me without understanding what it is God wants you to have. And so we pursue things that God doesn't want you necessarily to have in your life, but he may want it in Aaron's life because he knows how Aaron's going to deal with it. And so we look at what Aaron has and say, I want that too. God bless me like you blessed Aaron. What's wrong with that? Because I'm coveting what Aaron has. I don't necessarily don't want Aaron not to have it. I just want it. My focus has shifted from God. Everybody following me? This message is one that needs to be understood so that we begin to focus our mind back on God. Because the question, again, as I said before, for me was how do I pursue the righteousness of God? If I don't understand what God requires, I can't pursue his righteousness. If I can only see what God wants to give me in this life, I can't get to the other side. I've got to understand what God wants. Just like the disciples then, we have to understand what God wants us to do now. And he's saying, guess what? If this world is passing by, what should your focus be? And I love the way God bless people, blesses people. You can see it. And then you say, why did that guy get all of that? And then later on, you see what they do with all of that. And you say, oh, <laughs> they just fed how many people? <laughs> they gave all of that to what? And you, it, it, he, God knows how to pass his blessings along so that the people get it who need to get it. As they pursue God's purpose, God uses his people to accomplish his task and what we need to do is line up with God's purpose that's what Jesus is asking don't focus on what the transitory stuff do you not know that God is blessing his creation look at he has us looking at birds and then he has us looking at flowers to see how God uh, arrays them don't you know God will take care of you just do what you need to do and get on with it God will take care of you. That's what he is saying. But let's not be stupid. <laughs> he wants us to understand there's a purpose. There's a purpose. And that's what he's saying to his disciples. So for us, what's the application here as, he, as we go through this? I want you to uh, 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 Habakkuk uh, 4.17. Paul preached this. It's in the Old Testament. And, and, and Habakkuk, uh, we need to have this kind of attitude too before uh, they, the people are taken into captivity. He says, I know this is going to happen. And I, I don't care if I never have another olive grove, if, if I can't eat any more of the fruit of this land, if, if I can't have the comforts that I, I had before, if, if I... In other words, I'll paraphrase it. If I can't dress the way I want to dress, if I can't eat the foods I want to eat, if I can't have the house I want to have, if I can't go to the restaurants I want to go to, I am still going to praise God anyway. It doesn't matter. God is still on the throne. He is still God, and he's asking us to do something. He's asking us. He's asking us. To join with him. Now that, that's, that, that's amazing to me. That the God of the universe wants to use us in a mighty way that we might be with him. 
and he asks us to do certain things. He gives us commands. We, we want to know what does God want us to do? How do we pursue righteousness? You keep the commandments of God. What's the commandments of God? I used to go around in circles with myself about this. What are the commandments of God? That we love one another. That we love God and we love one another. Well, how do you love one another? You would be willing to die for them. What? That's absurd, Jeremiah. Who would be willing to die for somebody else? We're not even willing to... <laughs> We're not willing to die for other people. <laughs> it's just that God has a standard that's the bare essentials for his disciples. How do we demonstrate love? He just points it out. These are things that disciples do. But to get there, you have to be thinking. You have to have a knowledge of who God is. And how do I have a knowledge of who God is if I'm not reading what he wrote? If I'm not taking classes to learn how to apply what he wrote? And after I learn what he wrote and taking classes to uh, look at what he wrote and apply it, if I don't do it, what good is it? Uh, Jesus says, it's like, if you don't apply these sayings of mine, you're standing on shaky ground. <laughs> if you do not apply what Jesus is teaching about the attitudes in five, how we ought to be living and our concern about money and wealth and how we deal with others in chapter 7, if you don't apply those, you're standing on shaky ground is what he says. Put these things into practice and then that way we know we're disciples of who Jesus is. Turn to Philippians 4. Philippians 4. And then I'm going to conclude this lesson. Uh, the Philippians 4 is, is one of those uh, 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 scriptures that uh, people, uh, we quote often because they're, they're helpful uh, and they're comforting. You, you'd think I would know this one by heart, but I know somebody could uh, quote this by heart. <clears throat> Philippians uh, chapter 4 uh, verse 6 be careful of nothing mm -hmm. but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known and so Paul is uh, saying the same thing that uh, Jesus just told his disciples in, in Matthew 6 don't worry don't be anxious don't be overly thoughtful about anything but through prayer but by prayer and supplication he says make your requests known to God and 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 God will set up this fortress around you he'll protect and guard you and, and, and so that's what we need to remember to do we need to understand that we don't need to worry when God has it he is in control he has your back uh, but we need to go to work as if we're people who have faith in God. Uh, I like what, the, I like what uh, one sister said. God is faithful. God keeps his promises. And, 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 and the, the, the one thing I, I want to give you the duality in this. God keeps his promise to reward and his promise to punish. He is faithful. And, and so if you start stepping out there doing crazy stuff you got to remember he is faithful God is faithful don't don't you forget that part and oftentimes we think that God is faithful he's gonna bless he's gonna bless no matter what we do he is faithful that there's a consequence for doing some stuff and he will execute the consequence he is faithful and so when we say God is faithful we under I understand he is faithful anybody ever been on the the consequence end of God's faithfulness just me <laughs> so 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 when you when you're praying you get down there and you think God don't get into this asking mode asking mode asking mode I gotta have it mode I gotta have it mode I gotta, I gotta get it mode instead thank him thank him and then when you get through thanking him, sometimes your request may be, Lord, bless me in the way that you see fit. And you get up and going about your business, knowing that God will take care of you. 
God is faithful, and I'm glad he is faithful because he was faithful enough to see that I needed a savior. And he rescued me out of the banjo ditch of life. And if you know my story, it was a banjo ditch. And your, and, and your ditch may not have been like mine, but you were in the same mess. And God sent Jesus to rescue you out of that same mess. The thing we got to do is believe that Jesus is who he said he is, that he is the son of God. And God sent him to die for your sins. See, the penalty of being in that ditch was sin. He told us not to go there, but we did anyway. He could have left us there, but he decided to pull us out. He rescued us. And so we confess that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, the holy one to save us. And we put our faith in him. It is faith in Christ Jesus that saves us. It is faith in him that saves us. And faith has an action. The action is obedience. And I've come to the conclusion, if Jesus said be baptized, guess what I need to do? <laughs> be baptized. I don't have a question about it. I don't have an argument about it. I don't need to ask somebody, is it necessary? I just, I'm just going to do it. Because he said be baptized. Uh, so do it. And, and so a baptism, I understand, puts me in a relationship with him. I understand it has some consequences. It erases my sins and puts me into a whole other category. He takes us, the, the, the sinner, that guy, uh, the person who is in that banjo ditch covered in muck. He takes us baptism, takes us out, washes us, and makes us and uh, gives us new garments to wear. As if we'd never been in that ditch to begin with. That's what he does with us. Baptism does that. It gets rid of that filth called sin that everyone has it gets rid of it and then he says i'm going to take you out of the kingdom of darkness and put you into the kingdom of light and that's where you want to be and this kingdom of light is not the diablo's bling but it's the real thing it's the light of christ that shines in you and how do i know that because it changes the way i begin to look and it changes what i want to begin to learn about and so as a disciple of God, as a believer of Jesus Christ, guess what I want to learn more about? I want to learn more about him. Not because, he, this is what I've grown to, not because he said do it. Yeah, I do it, because, but not because he said do it. Not because there's a reward for doing it. I do it because I understand now what it means to love somebody. Do you understand doing something for someone who loves you and you love them back? If you haven't grown to that point, if you're still at, I'm going to do it just to obey, I'm going to do it because I don't want to get spanking. That you're, that's, that's the fear mode. But I want you to live as Christians who understand what love is. I do it because I love God. Look at what he's done and what he continues to do. Look at what he does for me. And after all of that, it's not about fear of retribution from God. It's an appreciation. And I don't want to disappoint someone who loves me that much. That's where I am. And so the disciple learns that then, that God loves you, you love God, and you continue to exercise that faith as you live day by day. You understand that relationship you have and you live it day by day, moment by moment. Understanding God with us, in us, our hope of glory. If you need to respond to the invitation, need to put Christ on in baptism and let him be your savior, you can do that today. If you need prayer, and who doesn't need prayer anymore? If you need prayer, you need, you're trying to work through a special situation. You're just trying to get closer to God. You're just trying to understand this God thing and God dynamic. If you're trying to get to there and you just don't know where to do, you don't know where to go, we can pray for you and begin to think, change some things around. We can pray for you and thank God for the situation you're in. 
the situations we're in sometimes is to help us learn what it is we need to learn so that we can grow into the people God wants us to be. So thank God for your situation. If you need to respond to the invitation, it is yours. We have a song selected. Let us stand and sing the song of invitation. <laughs>